I think at the end of the day, when his term is over, I think the debasing of our nation, um, the constant non-truth telling, the just the, the name calling, the things like, I think the, the basement of our nation will be what he'll be remembered most for, and, and that's regretful. You know, you would think he would aspire to, to be the President of the United States and act like a President of the United States, but, uh, you know, that's just not going to be the case, apparently. The good news from today may have been that the president did not attack a gold star widow. He did attack a fellow Republican and the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Bob Corker of Tennessee. President Trump woke up this morning, grabbed his phone and called Corker incompetent, a lightweight and saying he couldn't even manage to get elected dog catcher. Corker returned the favor, accusing Trump of the, quote, same untruths from an utterly untruthful president. Hashtag alert the daycare staff. Politico reports the state of play this way. Senate Republicans would prefer that the ongoing Corker-Trump spat fade away, particularly as they barrel into an ambitious tax reform push that they want to complete by year's end. Influential GOP senators say succeeding on a tax overhaul is paramount, particularly with the collapse of Obamacare repeal efforts earlier in Trump's first year in office. But can you imagine Corker and Trump at that same lunch today? Well, here for more, Mike Murphy, veteran Republican strategist who worked for John McCain's first campaign for president in 2000, among others, and Robert Costa, Washington Post national political reporter, moderator of Washington Week on PBS, and an MSNBC political analyst. Mike, I'd like to start with you. What happened to your party today, and do you believe your party is cleaving in two? Well, I'll tell you, nothing is a stronger truth serum in politics than not facing a primary. So you've had both uh, Corker now, you know, who's retiring, and Jeff Flake kind of smash the chains, and they're being speaking with a lot of candor. And both these guys are conservatives, too. This is not some moderate conservative fight. It's about the president's character. What makes this particularly important, I think, is that they are saying in public what most Republican senators are saying in private. So these are not rare opinions here. The question is, will this hairline crack start to grow inside the party, particularly as we face a year from now, it could be pretty tough midterm elections. Well, that's the question, Mike. Are you looking for incumbents uh, who don't plan to leave the Senate? Uh, are you looking for profiles and courage to line up behind these guys? Well, I've been in politics too long for that, Brian, but I'll tell you this. If we have a rough midterm, putting aside the legislative challenge of the president declaring, you know, Twitter war on two votes he may need, if we have a rough midterm, particularly in the House, then you've got a bunch of senators who are up in 2020 who may get corkeritis and say, wait a minute, I'd rather finish my term with freedom and candor against this president for a couple of years. You could also have Mitt Romney potentially win the Senate seat if Orrin Hatch retires and Romney decides to run. That, you know, so all of a sudden you've got a caucus that could be six, seven, eight of these people, not just Corker, Flake, and McCain right now. Uh, Robert Costa, I want to show you a moment from uh, Sean Hannity tonight. We'll talk about it on the other side. For all you never Trump senators that are headed for the exits, people like Corker and Flake, you know what? Guess what? You guys, you know, take your other colleagues with you. Mitch McConnell, goodbye. Ben Sass, goodbye. John Cornyn, goodbye. Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins. So there you have it, Robert. Uh, that's the climate right now. Sean Hannity's wish list of big name senators he wishes were out of the chamber. That is the wish list, but as a reporter, you have to look at this map and wonder if there could be some unpredictable situations if the Bannon wing of the Republican Party continues to get, as they claim today, their political scalps. Because if they force Senator Hatch or prompt him to retire in Utah, you could see Mitt Romney run. People I know who are close to him are encouraging him to get in that race uh, should Senator Hatch step away. In Mississippi, uh, Senator Wicker probably faces a challenge, uh, and he faces one from Chris McDaniel, who almost won the seat in 2014, likely to run. Uh, but a lot of Republicans want to make sure Wicker stays there. President Trump has said he could fight to keep Wicker in that seat. In Tennessee, it doesn't look like it's going to be any kind of far-right candidate. It will be Congresswoman Blackburn, who has uh, fans in both the establishment GOP and uh, in the uh, hardline wing of the GOP. So how this all plays out, Brian, remains to be seen. So, Robert, in your opinion, was today a turning point of any kind or a Tuesday in October? 
Oh, a major turning point because Senator Corker was then echoed and amplified by Senator Flake. And this was a, a rally cry from the traditional uh, block of the Republican Party who have venerated the values and political style of President Reagan ever since Reagan was in office. They have championed that form of republicanism ever since, and they have seen it fall apart ever since George W. Bush left office uh, in, in January of 2009. So, Mike Murphy, if you were advising, let's take that graphic, Sean Hannity's hit list. If you were advising any of them what to do, what to say, what, how do you label this Bannon thing that's emerging? Is it kind of a nationalist wing of the Republican Party? If successful, do they arrive in Washington with any allegiance to anyone or anything? Well, I think the senators that uh, Sean Hannity was carping about are all in pretty strong political shape at home. Yeah. I think they can take a primary. I mean, the Bannon wing has been running and losing in Republican primaries in most places for 15 years. I was part of the effort that helped beat back Chris McDaniel in Mississippi last time. I think it'll happen again for Wicker. And I, just a footnote on Bannon, he's doing a lot of high-fiving tonight because Jeff Flake got out. But his candidate, Kelly Ward, is now in a much weaker position than she was yesterday, because in Arizona, other candidates are going to get in, including potentially a couple of pretty strong members of Congress. So I think Kelly Ward's chance of being the nominee, let alone ever make it to the Senate now, are extremely small. Mike. So it may be a Pyrrhic victory for Mr. Bannon. That said, there is an intimidation factor, because politics is often the art of the bluff. And Bannon is holding those anecdotal cards right now. We'll see where we are, you know, in seven or eight months into primary season. Robert, we're now almost at 1130 on a day when Donald Trump was attacked from the floor of the U.S. Senate. Uh, Twitter crickets so far. Is that going to stay that way? I asked some of my sources at the White House tonight, what is the president doing? Is he following all this tumult? And they said he is, uh, but he's a little on edge, one of them told me, because... He knows that Senator Corker is out there, highly critical, now Senator Flake. And this all comes on a day when he was trying to project Republican unity, going, in a rare, to, going to the Capitol in a rare visit to talk up tax cuts. And now that whole project hangs on the precipice. The president knows if he goes to war in a, in a really active way against Flake, it disrupts that, that aim and ambition for taxes. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.